Hello, everyone, and welcome to another Fusion 360 Live. My name is Brad Tallis, and I have with me our good friend, Angelo Juris. We're doing something a little bit different today where um, we're, we're, oh, I got to turn off my audio, just a second. <laughs> uh, where we're actually streaming straight from a Zoom meeting um, because we're both going to share something today. So I'm going to start out with having Angelo talk about where he's been for the last couple of weeks. Um, we were we did a pause on the live streams um, because pretty much our whole team was crazy busy, either on vacation um, or like Angelo will talk about his, his experience he got to do in Las Vegas. So Angelo, why don't you take it from here? All right, hello everybody. Uh, hope you guys can hear me with uh, this uh, new, uh, Thing we're trying brad brad streaming it so let me know brad is it all good yeah all right great so. okay cool so let me uh so it's been a while since i've been on i appreciate everybody being here and these are always fun to do uh so as brad said uh, we took a little bit of a break and i was traveling and i was um, invited to participate at battlebots event in las vegas supporting Haas Automation and obviously Autodesk Fusion 360. There were 64 teams there participating in the championships and they were doing filming. It will air later in the year. I believe it's coming in December. So I need to, I can't talk about what I, you know, details, things like that, but I can just share some things that our team did. And I have some uh, photos and uh, pictures I can share with you. Let me share my screen and let me make sure that this, uh, that I can get this to show one moment. <laughs> All right, share screen, here we go. Actually, what I can do, I can just share the PowerPoint. Let me just do this guy here. All right, so let me drag this guy in here. Let me move my video. Hopefully you can see that. Yep, looks good. All good. I suppose I could do pre pre presenter mode. And it's on my other screen. <laughs> I'll just leave it like this. Okay, so I was at BattleBots in uh, Las Vegas. And let me go to this screen here. Come on. Okay, so here's a, a picture of the pit area in the top left. And then on the top right, uh, that was the pit area. I blurred it out because we can't really show much there. Uh, we had a thing called the hospital uh, here in the lower right-hand corner. And on my phone, every day we showed up on site, we had to answer some questions. We, have to, we had to be COVID tested and uh, you were clear to work. So when you got on site, you'd show the app uh, on your phone and they'd give you a wristband. So we, that was a daily thing to, so they can monitor who's coming and going and that everybody's healthy and safe. Um, yeah, so Angelo, how, how did you get invited to this? Like what was the, what's the whole backstory of what, you know, battle bots and why we were there and Haas, et cetera. Yeah. So the battle bots teams, when they're participating uh, in the, in the battles, they get uh, damage. They take damage to their uh, bots and they need parts uh, repaired or remade uh, on site. Obviously all the teams, they come prepared with the toolboxes and spare parts, but sometimes they take damage and uh, new parts need to be made. So we had this, uh, actually a job shop, a machine shop on site and Autodesk and Haas, uh, were sponsors of the event. And, uh, Haas was gracious and donated some machines and a ton of tooling and Autodesk. We had our staff there to provide the machining support. So we had, um, People there as uh, the teams came to us, we had a QR code. I have it a little later in the slide. I probably should have uh, uh, brought it up to the top. But so what we had, um, hopefully you can see this, uh, teams would scan the QR code. Our operating hours were 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. And again, it was called the hospital. And uh, so uh, we just write down who's uh, on deck, a uh, number of parts. Is it a milling part or a turning part? We had two mills. We had two lathes. And uh, we utilized them all. And we had materials from aluminum uh, to armor plate and titanium and you name it. It was all very hard materials to cut and machine. So that was really fun and challenging. There's a cool, cool atmosphere. Uh, so um, 
Here's my buddy, Devin. He's a rock star. He's an autodesker. He's a very good machinist and he was on site and every job that came through, he just banged them out and was super efficient. And every job that came through the teams needed because they had an upcoming fight. We also prioritized the fight based on who's up next. So uh, it was a lot of work. So as of the second day, we had about 40 jobs in the queue. We pushed a total of 200 individual jobs through the hospital in a 13 day event. Um, again, that was, very, that was a lot of work uh, for four machines. We had a whole crew of people. And again, like I said, some were just repairs, some were shorten a piece or mill off the top face or open up a groove or a slot for a mechanism for something uh, to work smoother. Um, and like I said, we did a combination of fresh parts from scratch. And other times we were just doing modifications of existing parts and other, other parts, um, the teams would have a fight and then they would re reevaluate and up, update their design and we'd make them a new part. So it was really cool to meet all these teams from all over the world. Everybody was super friendly, super um, glad that we were there. And it, it was a really, really good event. Yeah. And it sounds like there was a whole team of people. In fact, I see some of them were actually attending um, oh yeah, like Al and Kaching and those people. Um, so yeah, there was a whole crew of people there. So some people would be like programming the part. Some people would be, um, you know, sending that to you. For example, you'd like load it into the machine and and then basically run the jobs. Basically, and yeah. Like you said prioritize them, etc. Right. Exactly. Yeah. I thought I had a photo here um, of the. Uh, I guess I don't. Uh, I thought I. Oh yeah, this photo here. So we had this uh, answer bar set up where we had four computers. We had staff, Autodesk staffers there. Uh, and then the teams would come up, talk to them. The teams would share their models with the Autodesk staff. And then we would all huddle up um, at the beginning of the day. And every few hours, we'd review all the jobs that were in the queue. And someone like myself or Devin, we'd say, OK, this job goes on the mill. This job goes on the lathe. And this person will do it. Uh, so it was really cool. So we had a, a, a nice uh, job shop set up. We had an air table where the teams, like I said, would scan the QR code, send them the send in the models uh, and a description of what they need, the quantity and material, things like that. Also, another cool fact, McMaster Car was on site and providing mm -hmm. deliveries twice a day for materials uh, like raw metals, any fasteners, cutting tools. Uh, even we ordered some calipers because we were a little short on site. So, uh, so if you had your order in uh, by 9 a.m., you'd get your delivery towards the end of the day. And I got this sun right in my face. I'm trying to move to the <laughs> side. Sorry about that. So uh, the teams, if they need a material, they'd order material by, I think it was 9 or 10 in the morning. They would come by 4 or 5 p.m. the same day. If you ordered end of day, like 4 or 5 in the afternoon, you'd, you'd have it by 8 a.m. the next morning. So it was super efficient. Everything was a fast pace. It was it was just like an emergency room where we would triage things and it was a very fast pace uh, pressure cooker. Everything was needed yesterday uh, because, like I said, the teams had to perform and they had a few they had a fight and they needed to fight again. So I can't disclose who, who was there and all. But uh, and, you know, details, but it was a super cool event. And then another couple of things. So let me scroll through these slides. Yeah. And to add to that, somebody asked, like, what was your favorite team and stuff? And unfortunately, you'll notice a lot of the pictures we'd had to blur some stuff because we can't, yeah. can't even say who fought who or anything like that. So yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so here's a team. Oh, the other cool thing, there are tours coming through. So if you bought tickets for the event and you had a VIP ticket, they did a tour with 20 or 30 people at a time coming through the the pit area and you can see from this photo there's like a sectioned off roped area so they'd walk through the pits they'd be able to interact with us and interact with the teams and like this uh photo here this is one of the teams signing autographs uh on uh, i believe these are devin's kids uh they had a tour through there so that team was very cool we made um good connections with those guys and the other things we did is we leveraged fusion 360 to to um, mimic what we were doing on the machine tool. So in this uh, picture here, the big picture on the left side, that was the Haas VF3SS. We had a vice, we, there's the probe, and then we had the uh, aluminum plate with half 13 threaded holes so we can clamp parts to it. And this next image here uh, on the right-hand side, bottom right, that's the real image. And on the top right, that's the Fusion 360 model. So we'd literally drop in the model, we'd have a replica of what we had on the machine. 
And this was just a, a quick part we made. And it was really good because uh, we could visualize if there's going to be any collisions with the clamps and things like that. And this material was uh, 4140 steel. So um, that was just one of one of many parts we made. It was super cool. Uh, a couple other yeah, things. To add to that, I'm sorry to interrupt, yeah. Angela, but that yeah, that simulation is fairly new in, in Fusion 360, but it's really cool because it actually has the machine, it has the vice, it has the clamps, and you can simulate you know, where is the, where the, where's the head moving? Is it rotating and all this kind of stuff and see what's happening even before you cut the expensive titanium part or whatever. Yeah, so. exactly. So this image on the bottom, right? <laughs> the team dropped it on our bench and they wrote their team name and said, please cut me on it. So that was this part here. Uh, so there was a lot of, uh, like I said, good interaction. Everyone was super cool, super friendly. Um, apologize if there's duplicate photos. Uh, but Haas was super instrumental in making this happen. Uh, yes. This over here in the bottom right-hand corner, that's Devin Dupuy programming a part on the right-hand side. That's Keith Root out of uh, Canada. He came down to help us for a few days. He's a solid machinist and applications engineer. Um, like I said, uh, I wish I had more photos, but like, for example, this one, we were doing interviews and uh, we had a full crew doing interviews and my buddy Kyle's in the background there. And these are... Um, uh, film crew that Autodesk brought on. And then the uh, woman on the right there, that's Muna. She's on the marketing team at Autodesk. So uh, this breeze through these photos here and the crew here we had, uh, we had uh, Xander, we had uh, CJ. These are Autodesk. Well, and Xander was an intern. CJ's Autodesker. There's me. This is one of the team switchback. They came to thank us for the work. So we took a photo. Uh, and then Devin and Kyle and Jamie, she's from Toronto Autodesk Tech Center. And down here, most of the same folks. And we got Denise and um, Tatenda and Zach. Uh, so it was a good event. And then uh, my amazing partner, she showed up to spend some time. And I was there two long weeks. So she came and hung out a little bit. And uh, it's great having her there as well when you have that emotional support from someone you you care well, weren't you doing like 10 or 12 hour days or something wasn't it crazy? yeah yeah like here it was uh 9 a, 9 a.m to 9 p.m uh, the original yeah. plan is we were going to do uh, two shifts 9 a.m to 3 p.m and then a 3 p.m to 9 p.m uh, but the reality was once we got on site it was uh, the, the demands were much higher than we thought so a lot of people were working 12 hour days we tried to give everybody as much of a break as possible or realistically feasible so we did the best we could under the circumstances and going into it we we uh we thought it was just going to be like repairs and it'd be easy and we'd be able to maybe on the the machines we had maybe make some trophies or medallions for everybody but the reality of it is what uh, reality of it was there was no time uh, no downtime, no free time. It was literally like a, just a, you felt like you're in a washing machine, just tumbling all day long because <laughs> the pace was so crazy. And like I said, teams were coming to us and they needed help and support. Also got to see some of the events uh, live on site. So that was cool. Got to meet the producer of BattleBot. So he was a nice gentleman and his, his family. So it was overall a, a great event and good learning experience. And to represent Autodesk, I was honored. And also to represent Haas Automation because I have a very good relationship with those guys. Uh, Frank Ramirez, John Nelson, Mark Terryberry, all those guys, they're all good folks. And so they depend on us to make sure that their machines are safe and uh, that we take care of their equipment. So it was great. We couldn't have done it without that partnership from Haas Automation. Yeah, I totally agree. I was blown away. In fact, you, you were saying that those buildings are actually huge tents outside. Yes. And yeah, this yeah, is yeah. a whole shop basically outside in the tent. Yeah, so you can see here's a big tent. You can see the air yeah. conditioning because it was Vegas. It was 100 degrees plus. I don't know what Celsius <laughs> that is high 20s or so or low 30 celsius something like that uh so it was a big tent air conditioned and it is a very vibrant atmosphere it was super cool to to see yeah i see al just made a comment he said it was it was really a cool it was a lot it was a, definitely a, a pressure cooker but it was a great chance yeah. to make real parts with the software literally yeah. you know make something you know model something make it and then give it to the team so they can go run the race you know within yeah. the next hour kind of a thing it's probably yeah, pretty the, impressive this is al watmo here al watmo is the reason that i'm at autodesk he hired me a number of years back and uh also tim paul and cj those guys are were instrumental in bringing me on to autodesk but al watmo he's a director of manufacturing uh responsible for all manufacturing at autodesk so you know you're in good hands when the guy in charge of manufacturing tools that 
Autodesk and Fusion 360 can actually set up, program, and run a machine, and he's not afraid to get dirty. So it's cool to have. Yeah, and him I have there. to admit, Angela, I was really jealous when I sent you a, a Slack message, and you were like, "I can't. I'm right. I'm in BattleBots right now." I was like, "What?" Yeah. <laughs> so it, it was it cool. Was. We had quite a few people from Autodesk come and help out. Um, yeah, Haas with not only the machines, but I guess they provided a lot of tooling. Yeah, also, the cutting tools. They? Yeah, yeah. So they've got their own line of tooling. They have vices, they have work holding, they have um, end mills, um, turning tools, inserts, holders for, you know, the stick tooling on the lathe. They have pretty much everything you need. So we, this toolbox right here, that black toolbox where my cursor is and right to the left of Devin, that thing was full of a lot of cutting tools. I think it was in the neighborhood of 18,000 US dollars for the, how many tools were in there. And then uh, there are some tools we use more than others. So as we ran out, I'd um, send a message to Frank at Haas Automation, say, hey, we're running short on these end mills and they'd send it next day, you know, like soft jaws, uh, cutting tools, things like that. So it was a great event. Uh, I wish I could show more. Uh, we do need to be discreet a bit be with the, the event and honor that stuff. So, but uh, this stuff, it, it was super cool. And then, uh, yeah, the uh, the stage, this was a stage. It was just when you were there, you see battle bots on YouTube or on television. It's quite different when you're on site. It's it's vastly different. It's a game changer as far as like being there and just experience like the it's quiet. And all of a sudden you hear the ch the crowds and the, the robots collide and you hear their sparks flying and collisions. And it's super cool. And the atmosphere is really, really wonderful. Yeah, and the other cool thing is not only was Fusion used to help design some of these parts, there's some, some of the robots were actually designed using Fusion 360. We can't name which ones they are, but you will see right. that. I think you said it was December, I think is one. Yeah, I believe they're going to start started. airing in December for that yeah. particular season. Uh, I don't know exactly those details, but uh, uh, we can certainly find out and let you guys know. Okay. Well, Angelo, I, I really appreciate you taking time out of your busy yeah. schedule. Battle not box. only were you doing the 12-hour... <laughs> days you were also having to do your full-time job in between jobs there so i know you were crazy busy we're glad to have you back um so i know everybody <laughs> on the live stream was wondering when's the next you know manufacturing live stream going to happen and stuff like that we're going to get angelo back into the groove <laughs> once he gets caught up so yeah most um, definitely uh let me know what you guys want to see in fusion for cam and machining and i could do a, a live stream based on that Thank you. So, um, so I had a, a small topic, a short topic, and that's kind of why we did this kind of this dual topic today. I was just playing around with the command in Fusion to make these boxes. So check this out. And they actually like, they're so it's such tight tolerance and they twist, and, but they're hollow. So they're printed on my 3D printer. Um, and I even played around with, you know, how many twists could you do? So here's, here's another example with many more twists, but it's, it's almost like an optical illusion because it's actually two separate pieces and they fit perfectly together and they just almost like glide on each other. So I'm going to show how would you make something like this in Fusion yeah. 360. So looking at that so. second one, Brad, I mean, you, just looking at that, it's kind of mind blowing that they would like go together, but looking at the second one, it's almost like a super coarse thread yeah, uh, or like an auger or a corkscrew, but that's just fascinating when you see that. So we're- Yeah, it's we're almost like a fidget toy. My, <laughs> I had it upstairs and my kids kept playing with it. And, and then I'll show, if we have time, I'll show how would you even do something like this? It's kind of hard to tell, but it's a spiral in a particular shape. So let me go ahead and share my screen. Awesome. And I'll be on uh, YouTube answering questions for the folks okay. in the chat. So hopefully everybody can see the screen okay. Um, so I'm going to just kind of walk through and show how would you model something like this. And it's actually a pretty simple command that I don't think a lot of people know exists. And it's in the sweep command. And you can actually add twist in the sweep command. So I'm going to start out. I'm just going to create a, a new component. We should always start by creating a component. I'll call it, you know, vase 01, for example. And... Let's just start with a rectangular or a square in this case. So I'm going to do a center rectangle. And I'm just going to do maybe like three inches. And I'm going to leave the other dimension alone. I didn't even type anything in because I want these to be equal. So I'm just going to come in and say, I want um, 
that line and that line to be equal. So now I only have to change one dimension. So if I say make that one inch, the other one has to be one inch also. So instead of doing two dimensions, I just did one and made them equal. I'll create a, another sketch here on my front plane and I'm just gonna do a line. And I'm just gonna do a vertical line. Let's just make it maybe like six inches. And this is important because we're, it's kind of like the loft command, but we're gonna use the sweep command and sweep needs to know where to take this profile. So let me just kind of show you how this works. And then I'm gonna make a change here in just a second. But I'm gonna come in here and say sweep. I'll move this in case video is covering it up. What's the profile? So this is gonna be my profile. What's the path? This is gonna be my path. And you can see it literally takes that profile and sweeps it up along that path. But notice right here, we have some options, taper angle and twist angle. So if I type in 45, it's gonna take that profile, sweep it up that path, but it's also gonna twist it 45 degrees as it sweeps that. I could do you know, 360 degrees and you'll see what that looks like. So it's gonna take it and twist it around 360 degrees. And this is how I did you know, the, the smaller vase or whatever with the multiple twists. I'm gonna go back to the 45. You can even create interesting vases by, for example, maybe changing this taper angle. Let's add 10 degrees of taper and you can kind of see how it's starting out small, twisting and tapering at the same time, okay? Now, one thing I, I learned, um, to make these nested vases, you'll know, hopefully you can still see the camera. You'll notice there's a fillet on the edge. Um, I found it was actually better to create the fillet in 2D than it was in 3D. Um, and I know I'm going back on everything I've ever said where I'm always like, keep your sketches simple, do the fillets in 3D, all that kind of stuff. And the reason for this is because we're gonna do some offsets to get that, that fine clearance. So I'm going to, cancel out of my sweep. I'm gonna edit this original um, sketch here. And I'm just gonna do a 2D fillet. So I click on one line, click on the other line, and I think I'm gonna do just a 0.2 fillet in this case. And then I'm not gonna hit enter. I'm just gonna go ahead and continue clicking on these lines and it's gonna let me walk around like so. And now I'm gonna go ahead and hit enter. But you'll notice because I kind of changed my sketch, some of the dimensions or constraints were removed. So you'll notice I can change this height, right? So all I have to do is recreate that equal. So I'm gonna say that line and that line have to be equal. Now, why did it lose that constraint? Well, we kind of changed the length of that line by adding in these fillets. And so it kind of said, okay, I'm gonna remove that and let you recreate it so you can really kind of define how you want the sketch to look. So I'll do my twist again. So we'll do the sweep. What's the path? I'll say that's, that's the path there. And we'll do a twist angle of 45 in this case. Okay. Now what's interesting is in my 3D printer, I can say print in vase mode. And what it does is it basically takes the outside profile and prints just one really, sorry for the noise, one really thin layer. I don't know if you can kind of see that. So I don't even have to shell this part out. I can just leave it the way it is. And when I print in vase mode, it's literally just kind of, it's gonna create a spiral as it goes around every single layer as it builds this thing. Now you can shell this out if you want to. Um, so I could come in here and say shell, and let's just do like 0 0.02 to the inside. So I'm just doing a pretty, you know, really small thickness to the inside. Maybe like the thickness of my print head on the 3D printer. 
So I've created one of these, but now I want to create the other one that will fit over it. So what I'm gonna do is um, right click on vase one and just say copy. Then I'll right click on the top level and say paste new. If I just said paste, it would create a copy and paste it there. But then if I changed one, the other one would change also because it's a, a direct copy. If I say paste new, it's gonna create a copy of it, grab all the information from it, the sketches, you know, the sweep, all that kind of stuff, all my features, but it's not gonna be linked back to the original. In fact, I'm gonna leave it right where it is. I'm gonna say capture the position right there. And I now have two vases that are right on top of each other. And it's kind of hard to, to see that, but they are. I'm gonna go ahead and rename this to be like vase two, so I know the difference. And I'm gonna go ahead and activate vase two. And notice in the timeline, it copied all of the features. So what's kind of neat about this is I can come in and do an offset of my sketch. I'll just go ahead and click. In fact, you can kind of see the 3D representation of it. I'm gonna, so, um, let's do a chain selection. Grab this guy. I want it to go to the outside. I'm gonna make this one a little bit bigger. So I'm gonna say minus, um, let's do um, 0.04 in this case. So if I went 0.02, there'd be a little bit of clearance, but I'm giving it just a little bit more clearance than that. So they kind of slide instead of being a really tight fit. So I went minus 0.04. So I'll finish my sketch there. And it didn't change the model at all. All it did was I just added something to my sketch. So I'm gonna go into my sweep command and it's gonna be kind of hard to see, but there's my original profile. I'm just gonna come in and add that little offset to my profile. Say, okay. It did the shell afterwards, and now you can actually see the vase one and vase two. They're the exact same twist. They're the exact same three inch size, everything. Um, so it allows me to quickly make that the cap for it or whatever you want to call it. Now, when I print, I'm going to come in here and go into my tools, make. I'm going to go ahead and turn off vase two. I'm going to say make, and I'll just go ahead and click on this guy. And it's going to calculate everything for that one particular vase. I would send it to my slicer and hit print or I could even print it right from inside Fusion 360 in the manufacturer workspace. And then I would do the same thing with the other one. I would just come in here and hit print. I, so I printed these separately and then join them together. So it's pretty easy to do. And these are kind of cool because you can use them as, you know, vases to put things in or, or you know, have actual objects inside of here that, you know, you want to keep or whatever, like coins, et cetera, et cetera. So. Okay, um, so now what I want to do is kind of show how you could take this kind to the next level. So I'm going to open up my parameters. So I'm going to say change parameters. I'm going to kind of zoom this out so you can kind of see what's going on. So we're looking at base two. I'm going to create a user parameter and I'll call it, I think, twist angle. So twist angle. Now notice the unit is in inches. Well, an angle isn't in inches. So I'm gonna come in here and scroll down and you can see here we have angle in radians, degrees, et cetera. So I'm gonna say degrees and let's do um, 360, for example. I'll just say, okay. Now you'll notice I created a new parameter called twist angle. You'll notice the model parameters. Now we're I spelled base wrong, so I apologize for that. I'm gonna open up base two. Here's my sketch. In fact, if I open up my sketch, you'll see, sure enough, it was three inches. Here's that offset that we did, et cetera. So here's the sweep. 
And notice twist angle is set to 45 degrees. Well, I could come in here and say, I want it to be the user parameter twist angle. So I'll just go ahead and click on that, click somewhere else, and you'll see it instantly updates that um, vase right there. If I turned on vase one, you'll notice it didn't update, but check out how quickly I could come in here, edit this guy and say, that's gonna be whatever twist angle is. Click somewhere for the update and boom, both of those vases have now updated. It's kind of hard to see, but the two the inside and the outside. So now I can kind of just come in here and kind of mess around with you know different angles. What does 90 look like? I click on that one and it'll update you know both of my vases instantly. So using parameters, kind of a fun example. And then even other things like, um, for example, this sketch, here's the overall height. I could create a user parameter called height. I could create a user parameter called you know, taper angle or whatever, and then set all of these to those parameters. So for example, I'll just come in here and do height. And let's do um, nine inches in this case. Then I just come into my sketch here and say, I want that to be whatever height is. And you'll see it will update that vase. Same thing down here, I just have to update. And I could have done this parameter before I made the copy, which is what I probably should have done. But I just kind of wanted to show, um, oops, not, not that guy. Sorry about that. So we want that to be three. This is the overall size. Um, so sketch two, and I'll just come in here and say height. And there we go. Both my vases have updated. So kind of fun to use parameters to do that. Okay, looking at the questions really quick. Um, okay, so how would you create something like this? This is a much different kind of solution. I can't use sweep because sweep basically goes you know, along a path or whatever, and it's one shape. Loft allows me to do multiple shapes. So this would be more like a loft, but I'm gonna show kind of an interesting uh, trick here to do this guy. Okay, so um, I'm going to create a coil. So I'm gonna say coil and I'm gonna make this, let's just do maybe six in diameter, six inches. And notice it usually comes up looking like this, kind of looks like a spring or whatever. And I can change you know, the overall height and all that kind of stuff. So what we're gonna do is I need to create basically the path for that coil on the 3D print. I'm gonna change my section to triangular external. And here's why. Notice that there's a sharp edge along here. And we're gonna use that sharp edge. I'm gonna also change some settings here, my section size. I don't need it to be that big. Let's just do like 0.25. Um, my overall height, uh, let me just see what I did here, nine inches. Okay, so I get something that kind of looks like this. So six inches in diameter. I can specify how many revolutions that I want. So you can kind of see one, two, or three, et cetera. Um, in this case, I'll do um, 12. Actually, let's do 10. That should, that should be fine. But my height is, and then this triangular external. And I'm just gonna go ahead and say, okay. What I can do now is um, I'm going to create a sketch on this front plane. I'm going to project this little triangle here. In fact, all I really need is the point right there. And then I'm gonna create a line. So I just hit the L key. So I'm doing a line from that point to the center. I'm going to switch into my surfacing tab, and this will make more sense as we go along. <laughs> I probably should have shown the 
the steps I did um, in the actual model. But what we're going to do is we need to basically um, capture this path. And I'm going to do that with a surface. So um, let's do a sweep, just like we did before. So I'm going to say sweep. What's the profile? So the profile is this one line. What's the path? The path is gonna be this edge right here. So I'm gonna click on that, okay. And give me a second here. I'm gonna go back to my default, sorry. Um, so by default, it's set to single path. Okay, so then the profile was this line. The path was the edge of this, this coil, but you can kind of see I get kind of a weird result because the line is actually kind of rotating and twisting as it's going up this spiral. And so it kind of changes direction and all that kind of stuff. And I was like, well, that's not what I want. Well, under the type, there is path and guide rail and path and guide surface. So I'm going to say path and guide rail. So I'm going to actually select this other edge as my guide rail. Now, what does that mean? Well, it's going to take this edge, sweep it along this outside edge, but it's going to keep the orientation of that sweep. It's being controlled by this edge. <laughs> so you can kind of think of think of some examples here, like a spiral staircase. You want the railing to go up the spiral staircase, but you want that railing to stay horizontal, for example, um, you would use path and guide rail to do that. And so you can kind of see what it's doing now. I'm getting a much nicer result. It's taking that, revolving it around. I'll go ahead and say, okay, let me turn off the original body. And we now have this weird thin walled spiral going up and it has a path that we can use too so we're going to get to that here in a second okay so now what i want to do is actually create my vase so i'll create a sketch on this front plane here and i want to do um, my vase to fit inside this profile so i might start just a little bit lower let's just do something like this kind of bring my shape something like this. So I'm going to click here and say, OK. Now, obviously, I don't want this weird bottom of the part like that. So I'm going to line this guy up to be that way. And then you'll notice these green lines. These are actually the um, weight and tangency direction of the spline. And I can actually come in here and even on this guy, I can say, make that horizontal. And you're gonna see it forced the tangency direction of that spline to be horizontal. So now I might tweak with this just a little bit to kind of have a nice shape there. Okay, I'll go ahead and close this sketch up because I'm gonna revolve this kind of as a solid. So let me just do that real quick. You can kind of see it shaded up. I know that it's a solid profile. I'll go ahead and revolve that. What's the axis? I'll just do the uh, vertical axis like so. And I now have this vase body that I created. Okay. So you can kind of see how it's spiraling up, but notice it's sticking out. And if I were to sweep a profile along this edge, it wouldn't be touching the 3D model. It wouldn't work at all. It would only work where it was kind of close to the body. So I'm going to go back into my surfacing tab and use the trim command. So check this out. I'm going to trim this surface using the vase. So I'm going to say, let's start with the vase. And then I'm going to click on this. And you can see how that kind of turns red. So that is what's going to be trimmed away. I'll say OK. And 
turn off my ability to do it. Apologize, that should have worked. Give me a second here. Okay, let's try that one more time. So trim. The trim tool is that. That guy there. Did I do this correctly? Huh. Of course, in live demo, you're not sure what's going on. So let me show you <laughs> in this example here. Um, so here is that shape. I will fast forward and did the trim. And again, I'm not sure why it didn't do it on mine, um, but you can kind of see how it used the shape of the vase to trim that surface. Now I can come in and create a profile that I want to cut into this body. So I'm gonna have to create a profile and I want it to be at the end of this line. So I'm just gonna go ahead and do a plane along a path. So I'm gonna say plane along a path. What's the path? So I'm gonna go ahead and click here and you'll notice it allows me to put this plane anywhere I want on that path. So I'm just gonna bring it all the way to the beginning. Say, okay. Here's a cool tip. I've shown this previously, but I actually just learned this one fairly recently. So previously, if I wanted to change the size of this um, plane here, you can grab the corner of it. But I, I also, I didn't know this. You can actually grab the edge also. So I can grab that top edge. I can grab that side edge. So you can do like corner to corner, or you can grab the individual edges of the plane to make that a little bit larger. I'll go ahead and create my sketch on there. And let's just do maybe, um, I don't know, like a point, I don't know, point four or something like that. Um, circle. And I'll finish my sketch. Okay. I think that's what was going on in my last one. I'll bet you is I have visual style. No, I guess that's not it. Okay. Um, so I'm going to take this circle and sweep it along this path. So I'll do a sweep. Single path. What is my profile? This is going to be my profile. What's my path? Now, if I have chain selection turned on, it's gonna to wanna to go all the way around, but it's also gonna to wanna to do here and down. And that's a lot of math for it to calculate even more of. So I'm going to not have chain selection turned on, but that makes it so I actually have to click multiple times. So you'll notice it's gonna do there until it hits this edge line here. But all I have to do is hold down my control key and just kind of come in and select these rings so I'll stop there so you can kind of see what that's going to look like. But it's now taking that circle and sweeping it along this curved path, which follows the curvature of the 3D model. And that's exactly how I went about um, creating this particular vase. I'll select all of those so you can kind of see what that looks like. Again, it's having to calculate quite a bit, but there you can kind of see it twisting around. Um, I'm gonna cancel out since I already have done this or whatever, but you get the idea. So let me advance forward here. So there's that result. And then all I did was um, add a fillet to the top edge and the bottom edge. So here it was with just the circular cutout. And then I just did a fillet I could have done a chamfer, doesn't really matter. Um, and then I got that result, which I then 3D printed and you can kind of see um, what that looks like when it's all said and done. Okay. Let me uh, stop my share really quick. Um, let me take a look at the questions. I don't know, Angela, if there was yeah. any. 
yeah everybody's uh, uh seems to be under control but i did want to show just a few more photos i wasn't uh yeah i see aaron asked the question do you need to shell the body first you don't have to in fact you could shell it afterwards i i shelled it first that way i knew how far it was cutting in and what thickness so so yeah great question this was not printed in base mode this actually has wall thickness it's it's really hard to see but if yeah, you can actually see through the fillets and stuff because it's kind of thin walled. It's kind of neat. Um, but yeah, good question there. So that's yeah, super cool. Um, Let me uh, share my screen one more time before the top of the hour. I wanted to did wanted to point out the battle bots uh, VIP area was cool. That was here. This was the entry as people walked into the event where the fights actually were. And then adjacent to that was a VIP area. And then um, this gentleman here, Paul Sohi, he was uh, very instrumental in making sure that everything went off without a hitch in the event. So I thank Paul and also Denise. And then here's some more folks. Um, here's the bot whisperer guy. <laughs> um, this was obviously no action taking place. And then some of our fusion support team were here. Uh, they were like programming for us. Uh, before the parts ever made it to the machine. And then finally, on the, one of the last nights, we all went out as a team uh, to just enjoy, you know, the accolades of being, you know, being at this event. So everybody who could, could have been there uh, was there, and we did have some team members take off earlier. So they weren't able to go, but everybody here was a super cool bunch, and it was really great to be a part of this event. So super fun. Well, we are glad to have you back and <laughs> jealous that you were at such a cool event, but I'm, I'm really proud. I work for a company that, that does stuff like this and that we have partnerships with companies like Haas that are willing to send, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of equipment basically to something like this. And, yeah. uh, and you were, yeah. you know, you and some of the other people were, you know, working on those machines using Fusion 360. Yeah, yeah. Parts, you know, 200 parts in what, 12 days or something like that? 13 just, days, yeah, 13, 13 days, days, 200 different parts, yeah, and uh, like different line items, so, um, yeah. and some of them were two or three of, like, I need four of these or five of those, so we had 200 individual line items, and some were more than just one, so, yeah. and some could have been a left and a right. Uh, to a part. Oh, yeah. But and then also, yeah, again, thanks to Paul Sohi and Denise Gordon. Denise actually was supposed to be there day one, but she got COVID uh, the week before. <laughs> so she was stuck at home still doing stuff via the via, um, uh, Slack and stuff. So they were very instrumental. I couldn't have done it without their help. And then again, thanks to Haas Automation, uh, awesome. Denise and Paul and everybody else that showed up. I can't name everybody's names. It's not enough time, but thanks for everybody that <laughs> supported it yeah. and um, and thanks for covering for me brad while i was gone <laughs> yeah. i was crazy busy too that's why i wasn't doing live streams but yeah so for all of you that attended and watched we appreciate this this was a little bit different kind of more of a hangout with angelo kind of a thing and a quick tip you know from me um, but like angelo said if you have any ideas for upcoming live streams um, let us know. We, we might be doing some different things with live streams coming up here in the, in the next year. So keep an eye out for that. And um, if you decide to make a, a battle bot robot, Angelo will cut the parts for you. And <laughs> so, I have a kidding. little bit of experience. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, but, but we might, you know, go again next year or something like that. It'd be kind of cool to see what happens with this partnership. So yeah, everybody, thank you so much and have fun fusioning. We'll see you later. See you guys. Bye.